Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Mauritius compliance stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, Planning Permission You Say. Behind my house there's an area reserved for garages. Plans were drawn in 1968, and only three of the 18 allocated plots have a garage built. The remaining have a cement base and we park there. As spaces are narrow, 2.4 meters wall to wall, and brick garages are expensive, I thought of having a pre-built one installed for a quarter of the cost. Someone on the same street saw me take measures and asked me if I was putting a garage up. Said yes, to which they replied if I had gotten planning permission. Confused I said no, don't think I need, it turns out I do. To which he replied that he would then call them after I have the garage installed. After looking into it and confirming I do need to apply for planning permission at an extra cost, I was a bit annoyed. All I wanted was a place to use a storage, and here's this guy being kind of passive aggressive with his comments. The reason is actually he wants to play some of the plots near mine but no one wants to sell them to him. I can be very petty. So I bought a rundown Luton van and had it parked there. Scorn and using as storage. No planning permission required. The next one is titled, they could have gotten $80 of stuff for $1, but they wanted separate transactions. Let me preface with a quick rundown of our exchange policy at work, you bring the item and receipt in within 14 days and you can get an exchange for the money value of the item. It's no refund and no store credit, so on the day you come in, you need to shop around. We can't give back more than $2, so we encourage shopping as close to the actual amount of the items as possible. Now. I served a group of three today, two of them had exchanges. They loaded up all of their items, together, onto the counter, exchanges first. I didn't ask if they were all together, I just assumed they were being smart and pulling together their purchases and exchanges to get the most bang for their bucks. I ring through the exchanges, which comes out to $80 they must spend, and then I ring through all of their items. Their total comes to like a dollar, and I ask which of them is paying. This is when they tell me they want their transactions separate. I tell them if I separate it all, they'll end up paying more, so it would be better if just one of them pays the few dollars rather than they all pay separate. They got aggressive and told me they have to pay separately. They'd already been giving me the cold treatment, none of my attempts at giving good customer service were improving their sour moods, so I decided, screw it, I'll do these separately. The first guy's exchange was only $10, and he paid $24 because he spent more than the exchange. The last guy paid $17, no exchange. The middle guy, though. His total was $40, which I can't give back, so I ask him to a, shop for another $40 or b, take some items off the exchange and come back another time to shop for the $40. He doesn't realize quite what happened yet, or what he and his mates missed out on, he just takes option b I give him back enough items to where he only has to pay $1, and he pays. He and his guys leave, smug and angry as ever. I wonder if they'll ever realize their blunder. The next one is titled, you need to call me whenever you finish these. I do contract database work for a handful of companies. Nobody pays me to be on call, so the general rule of thumb is if you need something done, give me a few days heads up. Unless someone specifies that something is time sensitive and calls me to ask if I can bump it up, I tackle things in the order they were received. I've been somewhat overwhelmed with the volume of silly little tasks being thrown by way the past few weeks but I get by on little sleep in then first place, so it's not unusual for me to be cranking out spreadsheets well after 10pm. For the most part everyone is understanding and cooperative, but there's one person we'll call her Lucy who is simply not okay with me not responding to and taking care of her requests immediately. She'll send an email, a text after 5 minutes, and then call on repeat until I pick up if there's anything she'd like me to do. I started off with the impression that this was simply someone who's been ignored in the workplace before, and I didn't want to be the person who confirms who concerns. So I spent some time kind of bending over backwards with whatever nonsense Lucy throws my way. About a week ago, Lucy sent me a massive list of unrelated tasks she'd like me to do. This has been her move lately as she tries to cut in line, come up with anything she might want done and throw it out there at the beginning of the week. 
I gave Lucy a call to ask about prioritization, as she makes everything out to be urgent. For context, anything being urgent means Lucy isn't doing her job correctly. When I asked what she'd like me to prioritize, Lucy laughed and said, my email. I explained that I was already neck deep for the next few days and anything that isn't time sensitive will be taken care of in the order it was received. Lucy didn't like this. She started asking me if I would do it if XYZ co-worker had been the one who asked. I told her no, that really has nothing to do with this, and that the reason I'm calling is to make sure anything she actually needs done in a timely manner will get done. She became indignant and threatened to tell the chairman of the organization about how I was ignoring her, kind of funny because that's who I was sitting with at the time. Needless to say I wasn't too concerned about her threat, but this is when I realized her, nobody listens to me, shtick is just a manipulation tactic. Anyhow. Lucy explains how little she cares, very little, and that if I can't be bothered to help her now, she wants me to call her whenever I get to each task from her list. I thought she was joking, kind of chuckled and asked if she really wants phone calls after 10 pm. She must have thought I was exaggerating or trying to claim I'm an incredible worker, because she responded with, if you think you work harder than me you're mistaken. Again, chuckled a bit and explained that I'm not necessarily busting my butt in the middle of the night, that just happens to when some things get done. Went back and forth a bit but she held her ground on demanding a phone call when I get to each task. Well, last night around 1am I got to one of her requests. Lucy wanted me to add someone's middle name to the email platform they use. This couldn't possibly be less trivial, certainly didn't have any follow-up questions about the task. I went back and forth about calling her, but I couldn't stop thinking about her attitude, belittling me, and most importantly insisting she get a damn phone call no matter what time or how stupid. She answered the phone and said, never call me at this time again, and hung up. Deal. The next one is titled, Malicious Compliance from US Navy Bowling Team. We were just following the rules. Okay, first let me say that this story is all in good fun. Nobody is that bad guy here, we are all just super competitive. So to give here is what happened September of this year. I am a part of a veterans bowling league where I live in California. So we have people from the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, and Coast Guard. Each branch has members from those branches and they are a bowling team. Now for charity, we each have a fee of $500 between the 40 of us, each team will face each other and the last team standing gets to donate the money to the veteran charity of their choice. Now it's all good and fun, but needless to say people get super competitive. Now our teams really represent age diversity regarding wars of the US. Every team has two WW2 vets, around three Vietnam vets, and four from Iraq and Afghanistan. Now it's important that I state that they don't have to be formed this way. It's just we do out courtesy for a team that might have more older players. Now the team caption of the Marine team was super ultra competitive like Walter Sobchak from the Big Lebowski. He'll always get tipsy and yell about how one of our guys was over the line, and other various things. So we'll call him Walter. Now in September we meet and faced the Marine team. We were one guy short because our WW2 vet wasn't going out because of the crisis. We said that one of our guys could bowl twice, but Walter was yelling about how, if we didn't have another player we would have to forfeit. One of the referees is an Iraq Navy vet so he could be our alternate, the problem is that Walter was yelling about how unfair it was because he was a pro bowler. Q malicious compliance. We read the handbook stating that so long as he is a member of that specific branch he could be our alternate for the day. He wasn't the ref for our game so that's something to consider. We later followed the handbook to the teeth during our game. Walter had a fit and started drinking more and getting more drunk. Because of this, he was really off balance when he went for his turn. We started compiling with the rule book and called him out on his fouls such as going over the line and unsportsmanlike conduct. Malicious Compliance X2. Walter got so drunk he couldn't play anymore. We told the Marine team these exact words, if you don't have a man to play you'll have to forfeit. So we won by forfeit, and we lost to the Air Force team soon after and the Army team won. They donated the money to help veteran families that need help with medical bills and other related expenses. The next one is titled, Give Me a Heading. This is an old story, one that was complied by my father. 
At the time of the story, my father was a young United States Air Force navigator, flying mostly on B-52s. At the time of the story, GPS units were not much of a thing, so he had to calculate the direction to go in, then relay this to the pilot, or the crew commander. This particular bomb run that the crew was running had a guest crew commander. The rest of the crew did not mesh well with the crew commander during this flight, and it showed. While they were doing a flight path that was supposed to be from point A to point B, navigator realized they were possibly heading to some unknown point Z not good. Thankfully, calculating where to go was pretty easy, as the heading the B-52 was going was 360, or north. Given the speed they were going, navigator figured out that they needed to go left. He didn't know how far left, just left. So, he told the crew commander. Go left. The reply was curt. What heading? Navigator at the time did not know what heading. He figured that as long as they went left, he could figure out what heading from there before they reached some unknown point far out of line. Again, he stated, go left. Give me a heading. Malicious compliance time. If you don't know about bombers like the B-52, they are amongst the slowest aircraft. A full 360 degree turn takes 8 minutes without stressing the craft. More than plenty of time for a young, prime navigator such as the malicious complier to figure out what heading he really needed. So, he called out on the system. Heading of 240. Slowly, the crew commander got the plane to turn. Time was bought. Then, at last, before the turn was complete, navigator called out a new heading. Turn to the heading of 265. Even from his position in the bottom of the aircraft, Navigator could feel the icy hatred of the crew commander. Crew commander was no one's idiot, he knew what Navigator had done. Silently, the turn was completed, and the bomb run was back on track. Crew commander was perfectly silent the rest of the bomb run. He never flew with Navigator's particular crew again after that. However, Navigator's crew started to get recognized for the accuracy of their bomb runs and their no-nonsense Navi. The next one is titled, Want Us To Clean Everything After Anything We Do. Okay buddy. Background, this was during an unpaid internship at a construction company, I was an electrical engineer on site for a new mall opening in a high-end neighborhood. The company was responsible for the electrical and mechanical works of the entire mall and a few stores owned by the mall itself. This was close to the project's finish and most engineers have been moved off to other projects, so I was treated as a fully certified electrical engineering due to shortage of engineers and managed the entire ground floor, two stores and a team of 40 or so technicians. I only reported to my site manager and did not interact with any other firm or contractor. After the first two months, I had my companies, technicians and site managers trust. I was even issued a checkbook, unsure if that's its English translation, it's a billing form, site engineers carry it around to issue repair, field change and other on-the-spot invoices because other contractors were on the site and they used to damage our fixtures so we made them pay on the spot. Now on to the main story. Characters, MPM, Mall's project manager, Arch, architect responsible for the stores, SM, my site manager, me, is me. Arch sends me a text at 10 a.m. Baron, SM gave me your number, MPM and I will be doing rounds on the ground floor and stores, make sure the technicians have made progress. Me texts back, sure, let me know when you are here and I will give you the tour. We continue working according to my SM's guidelines and my maps and to be honest, we were ahead of the schedule. Around 3 p.m., I hear a voice bellowing behind me. MPM, you. Are you Baron? What are you doing to my mall? I turn back confused and see a man wearing a black suit with a jacket walking towards me quickly and the arch behind running as fast as she could. Me, building it? Snarky I know, but at the time I really was confused and that is what came out of me. MPM, no you are most definitely not. How can you complete anything properly if you and your incompetent staff cannot even clean after yourselves? Do you need me to teach you how to wipe after yourselves too? Arch arriving out of breath, yes, Baron this is unacceptable, the amount of dust and residue on the shelves is not acceptable. She had a I am sorry on her face, but clearly did not want me to fight. MPM, come with me to store name and bring your idiot technicians with you. I call 10 of my guys that were around me and we walk together. The MPM and Arch start talking in English, thinking I did not understand English. 
Thankfully my technicians did not, they were foreigners who only spoke a single language as I can only imagine what their reaction would have been. MPM in English, you need to run this ship more smoothly Arch, you need to understand this is a master and slave relationship, make them fear you and understand you're in charge. Arch turns red and pale, knowing I understand English. She tries to warn him, but we arrive at the shop and he cuts her off. He takes the most obnoxious walk into the store put his finger on the shelf and passes it along, turns it towards my staff and I, all smug like and showing us a line of dust caused by metal works, sealing wiring and drilling. My technician started sighing and mumbling, is he for real? He knows we're going to cut more, right? MPM in English, watch closely. MPM, listen Baron you and your guys will clean after each cut and each thing you do in these two stores, I want to be able to see my reflection off of these shelves. I ought to charge you $20 just for cleaning that shelf. Something in me cracked and I pulled out my checkbook, wrote down cleaning a single shelf invoice for $20 signed it and had him sign it, took a $20 out of my pocket and gave it to him. Making the entire transaction on the spot right there. He and the arch walked off snickering, my technicians looked upset. Me, you all have smartphones right? Technicians, yes. Me, document everything you clean and send it to me. Later that week, I sent an invoice for 58 shelves between the two stores and front, back rooms, cleaned twice a day at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. at $20 a pop. It totaled $2,320, every bill we issue is overseen by the SM, who called me in. SM, Baron, why are we charging them all a cleaning bill? I explained the story, showed him the invoice I paid out, and the folder on the company serve showing my tech's members cleaning. The SM was furious, first he hated the guy, second he has been working with those staff members for over 5 years now and did not like them being characterized as slaves. He approved it and sent it. The very next day, the MPM, Arch and what looked like an executive walked in demanding to see the SM and called in our company's owner. I was not in on the meeting, but was outside, after lots of yelling and the trio furiously walked out. I was later told we no longer had to clean after ourselves, until the entire work is finished and I received exactly $2,320 as a bonus for my unpaid internship. All the technicians received a nice bonus pay for that week's work too, their pay is weekly. The next one is titled, New Manager, Meet Union. Backstory, I worked in a help desk, unionized tier 1 half computer work, for a few years. It was pretty casual and we took our union breaks, lunches when we weren't busy. When an internal position opened to become the manager of the department, I had all the requirements, credentials for the position, so I submitted my resume. Little did I know, and I found this out much later, that they created the position so a network engineer could be given a raise, otherwise he threatened to leave. So I waited for two weeks and heard nothing from our. One morning, in strolls the network engineer into the help desk. He points at me and my co-workers and says, no more breaks, your lunch is at 12 and your lunch is at 1, and continues to issue edicts. Shortly after he finished an HR rep comes in and lets us know that he's our new manager. I tell my co-workers, I'm going to take my last 15 minute union break, and leave the room. I happen to be on a first name basis with the union president, who balances her time between her job at my company and union work. I come into her office, close the door, and fill her in on all the new rules that violate our contract. She gets a wicked smile and says she will be right back. I know she's going to go put on her butt kicking boots. I go back to my desk, notice the new manager's door is closed, and let my co-workers know what's up. She must have read him the riot act because shortly thereafter he comes out of his office completely deflated and starts pointing to each of us in order. You, you get two breaks per union rules, but they will be at 10.15 and 2.15. So, each person starts doing just that. If we were on a call with someone at our break time, we would put them on hold, audibly proclaiming, I am going on my union mandated break in which my manager has decreed will be at exactly 10.15. That lasted about a day before he got complaints. We told him that we worked just fine when we took our breaks, lunches at whatever pace the corporation was that day. There were a slew of other things from the union rule book that we learned, and things got very rough for him until he started to loosen the reins so we could work cooperatively, as we had been, for years. The last one is titled, You don't know what you're talking about, just use what I tell you to. 
A few years ago I was working for a company building a specialized electrical switch room for some plant somewhere. The important part to know is that this room had to be fire rated for 4 hours, so if the room was engulfed in fire up to 900 degrees Celsius for 4 hours it wouldn't be breached. The guy running this job was a complete tosspot, in his own words he was a tradesman, an accountant, an engineer, a truck driver and had decades of experience. His job title was quotes estimator, now the client had specced a very specific sealant to be used to seal all of the joints in the room between where the panels joined to one another, and Tosspot had to order this stuff from Germany, and who would have guessed he didn't order enough, we ran out two thirds eds of the way through the fit out, so he goes down to the local hardware store to get some more. What he came back with was regular heat resistant silicone, the stuff you'd use to glue on an oven door seal that's only rated to 240 degrees Celsius, not only that the shit he got is bright red, while the specialized sealant is grey. So it sticks out like dog's balls that it isn't the right stuff just looking at it, but when I pointed it out to him he said, just use it, I know what I'm doing and you're only paid from the neck down, so we did what we were told, we squeezed this stuff in nice and thick sealing the wall panels to the floor. Now this was very early on in the process of building this room. After sealing the walls another one oh 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 odd hours of labor went into installing a few more layers of heat resistant flooring, insulation, doors, high voltage electrical cabinets and the like, everything glued, welded or otherwise bonded together in a way that's impossible to take apart non-destructively. When the room was finished the client sent out a few engineers from Japan to do the final ITP inspection, test procedure, and of course they picked up on the fact that some of the sealant wasn't this fancy stuff from Germany. What sealant is that? We gave you a spec product to use, where is the information on this sealant? The engineer says. Suffice to say we then spend the next three months disassembling, more like demolishing, the room, reordering all of the materials, none of which are cheap or off the shelf, over 150k worth in total, and rebuilding the room to spec. Toss pot was fired of course. Thanks for listening.